everybody. Glad you're here. Hope you're going to help me out and interact like you guys do with Pastor. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for what we're going to learn together and what we're going to share together. And I just pray for Pastor Sharon that you continue to be with her and, and help her and encourage her heart. And we just bless you today and give you glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So today we're going to take a journey. So some of you have been to Israel. I've been to Israel. Love it. It's a great place. When you go, you see all those Bible places, places in the Bible. Well, today we're going to take a journey in the Bible. So not, um, I'm not preaching or teaching scriptural things. I'm teaching you about the actual physical Bible. Now, some of us have been seasoned Christians, so we may think we know a lot of things about the Bible, but we as um, Christians need to understand our Bible and how to use it, and we want to be able to share with those who are the baby Christians or the ones who have just gotten saved, so they know how to use this word, because we've been taught over and over again that this word is super important, and that's how we walk in our Christian walk, and it is true. So how do we use this book? So we're going to cover a lot of things. Um, some of the things I'm going to cover um, may help you if you decided you want to buy a new Bible. So some of the things to kind of look for. Now this um, training that I'm doing is actually a 16-hour training. So of course I tweaked it to a one hour. Of course I don't all do it at one time. It's over like a few months, month period. Right? So you're not going to be able to see the slides on. Oh, she has. Yeah, she does have slides up, but they're having some technical difficulties right now. So this scripture in First Chronicles 16, verses 8 and 9, Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk, and the Hebrew is ponder, converse aloud, ye of all his wondrous works. And I've used this scripture for us to talk about the, this great book and how important it is for us. Next slide. So, Adi, um, is there a way you can put the slides up? Yes, thank you. So, next slide. So, this is a, we're doing the introduction right now, and then we're going to cover uh, the general purposes or standard things about the Bible, the exterior of the Bible the interior of the Bible, and depending on how far we get, we may continue on to how to use the Bible. So it's more like a teaching kind of thing. So, but, you know, anything that you've learned along the way, please chime in. Next slide. We're going to explore, like if you go on a trip, you go to the different places and you see them and you explore that's what we're going to do in the Bible. We're going to explore the Bible, the actual physical book, and what's there, what, where are all these little things in there, and how do we use them for our benefit. Next slide. What is the intended? So when you're looking at a Bible, what is the intended use for the Bible? Um, Bible study? Are you going to bring it to church? Because if you bring it to church, you don't want to bring, you, remember, you know that big, Bible that families have on their coffee table, you don't want to bring that to church. Or if you're blind, you don't want to bring your blind, um, your Braille book, because uh, we'll talk about it later, but there's it's heavy and it's big and it's not just one book. So it depends on where you're taking this Bible. Um, are you using it for daily Bible reading? Are you having family devotions? What kind of Bible are you going to use during family devotions? Journaling, when you're doing personal study, which Bible or Bibles, because when I study, I use several different versions and write notes and look at different ones. Uh, personal study, journaling too. Reflection, when you hear a message and you want to 
do a little bit further study on a part of the message that you've heard, then you, you want to reflect on it and see how does it apply to my life. But these are some categories or some intended uses of your Bible. It could be a gift for somebody if you're buying a gift for somebody. There's men's related Bibles, there's women's related Bibles, new believer Bibles, leader Bibles, professional Bibles, students Bibles, there's all kinds. So there's many different types out there that we can use. And you can have all of them. I have several Bibles as I'm sure most of you do. Next slide. And then you can also, um, if you have difficulty actually getting these physical Bibles, you can go online and get audio versions. Or even on YouTube, you can actually watch the Bible. They'll have scriptures and they'll read it out loud for you and it's big print. So there's no excuse if you cannot read a small little print. You can find it on, on YouTube or television even. The children's books are pretty neat. They have pictures because, you know, children love pictures. So that can be helpful to teach children by using children's Bibles. There's devotionals. Um, it offers reading plans and weekly devotions. Um, for those who need large print, there's larger print Bibles. So there's, you, you might not think about all of these things, but they're, it's out there. All these little things are out there. Uh, reference offers just the basics. Some Bibles just have um, just the scriptures, they don't, but that's not really true either. When you cover a little bit more, you understand that some Bibles don't have any references on it. It's just the, the, the scriptures. But there are a few, few keys in there, even though it's just the scriptures. Special occasions. When someone's getting married, you might want to present the bride with a Bible or the graduate. When somebody's graduating, you want to present the graduate. Um, nowadays, a lot of young people, though, prefer, prefer the Internet or prefer their, their device. So when they do that, they're, they're, a lot of times, my friends, they go to the library and they sell a lot of books. And one of my friends, she says she's found Bibles for a dollar that are totally new and inscribed in, in the front. People have written, presented to so-and-so for graduation and people sell them or give them away to the library. So you can actually find Bibles by going to the library and purchasing them for a dollar. So you might not want to, it depends on who the individual is that you're presenting it to. Or a military, or a person going off to the military, presenting them with a Bible, a new parent. So all kinds of different occasions, birthdays, study. Um, Study Bibles are filled with lots of tips, quotes, references, notes, charts, maps, graphs, and concordances. And we'll kind of go a little bit more in depth later on on those types of Bibles. Next slide. Translations. There's different types of translations. We're not covering reading level right now. We'll talk about reading level later. But there are different translations, and these are just a few. There are many different versions out there. Um, one of the ones that we use quite often here is, of course, King James, New King James, the Amplified Classic. Now, there's two different types, the Amplified and the Amplified Classic. I prefer the Classic. Uh, the, the Living Bible, the New Living Bible, Modern English Translation. So there's different types, and the different types are, have, are, have different categories. Some are word-for-word -word translations from the Hebrew or the Greek. Word-for-word, -word they translate it into English for us. Or there's the paraphrase, which is the New Living Bible or the Message Bible or even the Passion Bible. And then there's Thought for Thought, where they take a concept and then they try to present it in, in words so like NIV is an example of thought for thought. In the, on the reading levels, just to mention, ones that you see up here on the slide, it's kind of related to the education of the young people now. Because before, the grades levels were lower 
like if King James, it says up here that King James is for 12th or 12th grade level. In the past, it was lower because people in lower grades could read King James Version, but nowadays young people have a harder time reading it. Next slide. So types. Now I have a King James Version of the Bible and it, um, it has United Kingdom or British type spelling in it. And then some of you might not have noticed that, but so it, it is. And if you look in my column in my Bible, sometimes when it has references, it looks funny. And we'll kind of discuss that later. Why does it look funny? It's because it's written more for the United Kingdom than it is for America. So it's not really an America, American Bible. Devotionals are, um, have inf inspirational thoughts or personal application. But sometimes these devotionals, they um, are, whoever wrote the book, it's their personal information that they're putting in. So sometimes you need to check what they're actually saying to you. It's not always just because it's in writing that it's right, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, the parallel Bible is when you have four different versions or two different versions in one Bible, and they can be quite heavy and quite big, but they are useful, so you can kind of compare. When I do personal study, I actually go online and use um, the Bible versions on the Bible, and it'll give me the different versions for like a verse, and so I can see which one kind of helps me to understand what I'm reading. Uh, reference. References are at the back of the book, and we'll talk about that later. Um, study Bibles. Um, again, this is, can be de denominationally slanted, so be careful when you're using those. The Bible with only text is what I talked about earlier, where this is just the Bible scriptures. It doesn't have any notes, any kind of concepts, any references on the sign. And then wide margin. Some people really like this really wide margin so they can write a lot of notes in their Bible. Next slide. Now, I mentioned the Braille Bible. So I included it because, of course, we have someone who is blind in our church. So just so you know, Generally, it's at least 40 volumes, and it kind of looks like that blue Bible that you see in front of you. That's how thick it is. And it's stacked six feet high and weighs about 90 pounds and can cost anywhere between $600 and $800. So someone who's blind that loves the Lord, they're spending a lot of money to actually get the scriptures for themselves. What was that? Yep. Yep. And then cost. Cost can be a big factor. You know, we've been talking about finances and everything. Pastor's been talking about finances during our Bible study time since Sunday morning. But um, we're talking about cost of Bibles. So online, of course, that can be free. I mean, there is a cost because you have to pay for internet and everything, right? But Generically, there's no cost to these different versions of the Bible. Um, paperback Bibles um, can be less expensive, but they tear quite easily. They're good to give to someone who's just starting out to kind of get used to a Bible. So, you know, it's soft cover, small print, and it's not really durable. So they can be anywhere between 5 to $10 or even less. Sometimes I found a Bible that we used at the picnic. Those Bibles cost me about two, bu two bucks each. So you can find um, cheaper Bibles. And then there's hard hardcover, kind of like this, my NIV. It's this hardcover type Bible. So it's a little bit more durable than the um, paperback. It's easy to handle, and it's made of um, cardboard underneath here. It's great for gifts and can cost anywhere between 10 and $20. Imitation or bonded leather, they're leather type material. Now some of them are not, there's different types of leather. Some are not real leather, they're fake leather, but they handle like it. We'll kind of discuss that later, but it's sort of like this one. 
And that can cost anywhere between $20 to $100. And then premium leather, that's more my regular Bible that I use, but you um, can't see it because I have a cover on it. But it's top quality. So those can cost anywhere from $109 and more. And there are a lot more expensive Bibles. There's some people who invest in um, Bibles that are, um, what do you call them, antiques. And so you can spend a lot of money on those. So it just depends on where you want to put your money. You can also go on Amazon and Walmart and um, to find different, different Bibles and check out the price ranges if you're actually looking to buy a Bible. Uh, there are Christian bookstores that you can find Bibles at, and like I mentioned before, libraries, eBay, and the different, the different, which one? Savers. And some books, some um, regular bookstores, not just a Christian bookstore, but regular bookstores, a lot of people sell their Bibles back, and so you can find some there. So there's a lot of great places. And in others, you know, they might, you might mention to someone, I know that Sister Camille has given people Bibles, you know, for them to use and study, and they've appreciated it. So you have extra Bibles at home that you've bought along many years, you can give them away, and some people will use them accordingly. The next one is care. So this was something that I learned, I don't know, a few years back, even though I've been a Christian for quite a while. But when you buy a new Bible, did you know that there's a break-in period and there's certain things you should do? First thing you should do is you lay your Bible flat on the table and you open up to the first 100 pages and then you nicely press it down and kind of crease it towards the middle. And then you go to the back of the book and do 100 pages and do the same in front, another 100. You keep doing that, and it kind of helps to um, make your Bible more usable. It helps it to, it, so it's a good thing to do when you're break, trying to break it in. Another great thing to have for the care of your Bible is to, to cover it with a cover. So this cover is probably, it's from 1979, so however old that is. <laughs> so it's quite many years that I've had. And there's different ones. They have pockets in them. So this, my Bible, I actually put my tithe envelope in here, and so I have them for the, the week. And, and there's also a pocket in the back. Some have uh, zippers or zipper pockets even in the front. But it's really good to protect your Bible. Some of them even have handles where you can carry, carry them. Heat exposure. <laughs> so here in Las Vegas, it can get quite hot. And if you leave your Bible in your car, I don't know if you can actually see it, but my pages are quite yellowed. It wasn't like this when I first bought it, but that's from from heat and and years, you know, years of use. But the pages will start to. Um, you know, get yellowed and burnt, I guess you would say. And so some of my pages are kind of um, very delicate now. So I actually, to be honest, I do have another version of this Bible, but I'm having a hard time changing over, even though it's the same Bible. It's just uh, temperamental or whatever. I, I'm going to have to change eventually because the pages are getting torn. I've repaired them many times, but... It's come to the point where pretty soon I'm going to have to change over. <laughs> and then one year, I even, I left my Bible in the car. This was in Hawaii, and my car got broken into. And they didn't get anything but my Bible. So it was the one before this Bible. <laughs> so I was sad to lose that one, but they did steal it, because I guess they think some people leave money in it. I really don't need money in my Bible, only until I'm coming to church to do my an offering. <laughs> Oil rub. Um, some people, now I don't really do this, but some people actually rub oil on their, their Bible covers to keep it supple and, and nice looking. 
And then one um, one lady recommended to me. She says, yeah, she uses armor all, you know, for the cars. She uses armor all. She kind of rubs it on her Bible to keep it supple. So I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. And ribbon ribbon markers. Now in most Bibles, there's a a little ribbon, and sometimes they say to burn the edge, and you know, don't let it keep burning, but you know, stop it, and so it'll keep it from fraying in the future. And then someone else suggested to me to put um, Elmer, Elmer's glue on it to keep it so that it doesn't fray. Just some suggestions that people have had. Next. So we mentioned earlier the different covers. So there's Berkshire leather, which is actually pigskin leather. But they call that genuine leather. You know, they always give another name for things, but to, for really to, to know about it, it's actually pink skin. Bonded leather or scraps of leather ground and mixed together with latex and made into sheets that resemble te then texture of leather. So it's kind of fake, even though it's called bonded leather. Calf skin is the least expensive of the premium leathers. It's attractive, durable, and soft. And French Morocco, uh, split cowhide. So there's all different types of animals that they use to help us get these covers for our Bibles. There's, of course, we mentioned hardback, which is pa paper or cardboard, and then paperback. And then there's also vinyl. I haven't really seen many vinyl ones recently. And then there's also the three ring binder, or, you know, paper. So there's different types up there, but I haven't seen the three ring, ring Bibles in a long time, but they were at one time in existence. Next. So do you know what a yap is? Do you know that it's related to the Bible? <laughs> so a yap, which is quite interesting, is uh, if you see my Bible has a little bit of an overhang, well, some yaps, and that's called a yap, the overhang, it kind of protects the pages. When you're touching it, instead of touching here where the gold usually is, you're touching here, so your fingers don't really touch the sheets. So that's called a yap. There are some Bibles where the yap is extra wide, so you see in that picture there, it's extra wide, this little, um, where the sewn part is, it comes out like about that. So it's almost like if you could grab them and touch them together. And if you, you imagine a, a zippered Bible, if there was no zipper, but you still had the material that went that far out, that's the yap. So it does, it does have a purpose, but I never knew that it had a name. Like this thing here on your face called a film. I mean, that I learned a long time ago. Well, there's a yap on your Bible. Something as, little interesting that I learned. Next. Binding. So Bibles are bound together with glue. And usually when they use glue, it's more, you know, not even this Bible. There's glue is more the paperback Bibles because when you, when you pull them apart, after a while the pages start ripping. That's because it's only connected with glue. But then they have the next version would be glue and the sewn version. So they may glue maybe, I don't know, 20 or 100 pages together. They glue it together. And then they put it all together, glue each section, and then they sew them together. So it's a hybrid where they put them together. And then that Smith sewn, where it's fully sewn, usually that's the more um, expensive Bibles where it's fully sewn. And you'll see on the edge here that it's sewn to a material in the inside of your Bible. So those are some things to kind of look for when you're buying a Bible, if you want a really good Bible for the future. And that um, Smith sewn is actually the name of a, of a sewing machine, even though they call it a Smith sewn. Next slide. I mentioned the edges, so gilt, G-I-L-T, or gild is the same word. It actually means to put a layer or a coat of gold 
coloring on the on the edges of the pages so you'll see in this picture I have here the one in the right is more red I should have brought it but I have another Bible where instead of gold it looks more red but there actually is red and gold that's actually red and gold together but it looks more reddish so that's something to consider when you're buying a Bible now the other ones that are just the paperback Bibles Usually they don't put that kind of feature because that adds to the cost of the Bible. Anybody have any more ideas on things that you've learned along the way so far? Anybody learned anything so far? <laughs> okay, let's go to the next. Oops. And then some people actually take their Bible and they draw on it. They make their own artwork on the edges of their Bible. Usually it wouldn't be your more expensive Bible. It would be more one of these, and then they'll draw. So those are artwork that people have done in their Bibles. I like that green one. It's kind of pretty. <laughs> Just to give it an added flair, but I'm not an artist, so I really wouldn't do that to my Bible. Of course, many different colors, whatever color you want. But... As you can see, I'll cover my really good Bible so nobody will see the color. Mine happens to be a, a brown color on the inside. <laughs> Next slide. Size. Size makes a difference. Because if, you, if you're going to bring it to church, you don't want it too big or too heavy. Because you're going to carry, some women will carry it in their purse and they break your purse. So just depending on what you're using it for, size really does matter. And there's different types of dimensions. The regular one is the 9.5 by 6.5 and 1.5 this way. So that's the most common size Bible. Then, of course, there's the large versions, compact. You know, they have the really small ones. And um, thin line. I've seen thin line, and it's the whole Bible. It's pretty neat, but of course the print is really tiny. So. <laughs> and then the weight, the weight of the Bible. Some Bibles can be 2 pounds, some can be 10 pounds, some can be even more actually. So that might be a consideration if you don't want to carry heavy things. Next slide. Paper. There's different kinds of paper that are used for the Bible. There's brown wood, which is a brownish kind of oatmeal colored paper. And it's um, used in economy Bibles. So like we mentioned, the paperback Bibles, it's more that type. It's a little bit thicker. So when you highlight or when you write with pen, it doesn't bleed through as much. So that might be a consideration when people are looking for a Bible, how thick are the pages. Um, the free sheet are more cream or white colored. And they're more the more popular versions that are used in Bibles. They're acid free and they protect from discoloration. But of course, after many years, it'll still discolor, right? Because with age, things discolor. And orange, uh, onion skin paper, remember that, that terminology we've heard before? It's really lightweight and translucent. So you, my Bible is like that. It's kind of translucent. It's very easy to you can kind of tell the difference. So when I take notes, it does kind of bleed through. So I try to make sure the different types of pens that I use don't bleed through as much. Next. So there's some terms that people use in regards to the paper, and it's bleed through. And that we, we already discussed. So my Bible, it has the line to, it's called line matching and line on line. So if you actually take your Bible and you look at it through um, with the light behind it, what's happened is on one side of the page, the words or the, the, the sentence, you look on the other side, there has another sentence on the other side. So when you're actually looking at the, the scriptures, it doesn't really bleed through. 
But, I mean, you might see some because there's some spaces on your Bible. But that makes it different because it, it's easy to, if you have a Bible that is not lined up, you might, it, it might get confusing because you can kind of see the words behind it. But when it's line upon line on the front side and the back side, it's not as um, cumbersome when you're reading it. So that's something to look for when you're buying a Bible. The cheaper Bible will just put it on the page and it wouldn't matter if it lines up or not, but it, it can be kind of just hard on your eyes. Next page. The lettering, the, of course, the font size. So we have small print, medium, large, giant print. So there's all kinds of print levels. So it depends on your eyes and what, what's good for you. Another thing on lettering, not all Bibles have the red lettering. When Jesus was on earth, not all Bibles have this red lettering. So if you want to have that when you're looking at a Bible to purchase it or find one that you like, look for that. When go to, of course, it's during Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the Gospels, look there to see if the red print is there. And then a lot of Bibles have self-pronouncing marks. So those are hard to use because some of the names are really difficult to read. But my Bible does have the markings to tell you to make a long O sound or a long A or a short A. So they have markings in your Bible. So if you want that or if you're able to use that, you might consider putting that on your list of things to look for when you're looking at a Bible. Next slide. Layout. So this is a big section. Anybody have any more comments? The layouts. Lots of different types of layouts. So not everybody's Bible. If everybody was to open their Bible to any page in your Bible, it'll look different. The layout will be different. So we're going to talk about the different types of layouts of the Bible, how it's laid out on the page. So there are cross-references. So my Bible, this Bible, the cross-references are in this middle section. So Cross-references are scripture verses that are related. So if you read a verse and then there's a number or an alphabet there, it'll tell you where to go for a scripture that's similar or kind of gives more information. But it'll tell you in the middle where that is, what, what part of the Bible that is. So very important for when you're doing Bible study. It's very helpful. Headings. Some Bibles have headings across the top of the page. And some of them have headings in different sections or paragraphing in the Bible. So it just depends on your different versions. So, you know, that's something to look at. If you like those individual paragraph headings, that's something that's important for us Christians. But of course, those are just comments by the people who ever put the book together. So like a heading might be the parable of the prodigal son. And so you can find that and then read, read the whole story related to that. Other times it's separated or paragraph. There's this symbol, and we'll, I'll show it a little later, what it looks like, and that will tell you it's a paragraph. Or some Bibles, they, they darken the verse number. It might be darker than the other numbers that, to start the paragraph. And we'll kind of see that a little later. Some Bibles have maps in the back, graphs even. Next page. So the first type of Bible we want to talk about is the one column Bible or the single column. I'm not sure if you can actually see it. So it has all the scriptures in the middle and on the outsides of the page there's a lot of space so you can write notes on the outside. So it's, it's good for reading. It gives you lots of note space. And it's similar to a standard book when you buy a book in the store. It's kind of like it's written that way. Not quite. There is another Bible that's even more like what they sell in a standard book. And we'll talk about that one after we do this whole set. 
So this version is a New King James version that I found online. And um, a lot of people who use electronic devices, that's how it kind of shows up in one, just one column. It's not like sectioned off like how my Bible is. It has three sections. This one is like a one column when you're looking electronically. Next slide. Then you have the two column. And if, if you can see it, it has the scriptures all on one, two on one side of the page, and then the other side of the page is one and two. It's easy to read and it's easy to use. And there's a little bit of space on the sides for notes. So um, not long ago, this was, most Bibles were this way. But with all kinds of technology now, things they've changed. They're just different types. So that's this is more the traditional Bible. Next slide is the three column, and that's my my Bible that I use all the time. The three column. So scriptures on the left, on the right, and then down the center is references, and they they call that the three column. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, there is another version of the Bible. And this one is one of those I have on my list to buy. It's called the Reader's Bible. <clears throat> now the Reader's Bible allows you to read the word without um, verse numbers and chapters. So it's just the scriptures. So it might say Matthew, and it has just scriptures. And it's like a book. It's written like a book. And so you kind of read it without the context. So there's certain chapters in the Bible when you're reading, it goes to the next chapter, but it's a continuation of the past. It's like, why did they cut it there? So this one doesn't have that. It just writes it all out. So I, I kind of like it. So this version, this reader's Bible is a King James version, and it goes for about $40. So that's on my list of things to purchase later. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of want to do that one one year. You when you read through the Bible, I use different Bibles during the different years when I read through, and I kind of want to try and do that one and see how how it looks. No, it's it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. It's, it's just that under all of Genesis would be written without chapters. Wouldn't say chapter one, chapter two, and verses. It wouldn't have those numberings on it. Next page is paragraph style. So we're looking. First, we did the bigger layout. Now we're looking at what's actually there. So this is the paragraph style, and it's designed with reading in mind. It keeps sentences together, thoughts together, and it maintains the scriptures. Now this one. Um, it's kind of awkward when you're in church because what happens is they'll put it in a paragraph. So paragraph one, and then it'll have the verse one. And if you keep reading, then in the middle of that, it'll go to verse two. And then it'll keep reading. It'll go to three, four, and five. And then maybe there's another paragraph, and it lives four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So if pastor yells out the scripture reference, you have to look in that whole paragraph to find the little number. But most Bibles have it listed one verse one and then the scripture verse two and then the scripture verse three and then the scripture but this one it's all paragraphs so it's a little bit more difficult to use in church but yeah, i guess if you've used it quite often then it wouldn't be a problem so i mentioned about the verse numbers and the paragraph numbers later on in my um, study but i'm going to mention it now because we're not going to do it today um, those numbers so chapter one verse 16 or whatever, that didn't exist. So and, until um, the 13th century is when um, arch, an archbishop who was writing a Bible commentary, he decided that he needed some ways to reference it so people could know where he was at. And so he's the one who divided the Bible into chapters. And then in the 15th century, uh, a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, he was working on a Hebrew Bible um, concordance. And he did, so he did the Old Testament, of course. And so he put the verse numbers in. And then in the 
16th century, um, a printer, a French printer, he created a Bible concordance and he needed a way to reference even smaller. So that's when he put the verses in for the New Testament. So then they combined all of that and that's what we have now. So all those scripture references and all that, that wasn't in existence before. Before when they wrote up the scriptures, in fact, they didn't really have a lot of um, um, like spacing. They didn't use spacing. All the words were all together. So when they had to break them out for us, when they tried to um, translate it into English, that's why there's so many different versions because it depends on where you put the comma, where you put the period, because that wasn't all there. Punctuation wasn't there before. So just just the information for you that so all of those verses and numbers are not really scripture per se, but they're there to help guide us so that we can all talk and look at it at the same time and speak to each other and know where we're at. So it's the address. Next page. Verse by verse, I already mentioned this one, is that number one, and then you have the scripture, and then number two, and it's all um, on the left side of the page. And that's helpful when you're, when pastor's calling out the scripture reference, it's easy to find when it's all down the left side of the page. So this is more the traditional layout, except if you're using an electronic version. Well, some electronic versions do have the numbers on the side. So they're kind of accommodating that still. Next slide. Indexing. These are um, aids that help people. Some people, they like. So you'll see the one on the left. It's sort of like a dictionary where you have that little, um, they call it a thumb index, where it's cut out in the page already. And then the Bible indexing, the middle one, is where you can add tabs with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And you can put it in order and use that. Or you can actually write write in, like maybe the first letter of the, that's what the third one is, G for Genesis, E for Exodus, L for Leviticus, N for Numbers. That's what that person has done in that Bible. But uh, I prefer not to have that. My Bible doesn't have any of those aids or helps. And after a while, you get kind of used to where, where things are. You just have to learn what's in the Old Testament, what's in the New. And there's that's another part of my training way later, the other, other sections where I teach that part of it, how to, how to figure out where to go in the Bible and how to get there and how to think in your head, well, where, where is Hosea, right? So because those are the minor prophets and a lot of times that's the section that people get hung up on. Next slide. Additional aids um, that are in the Bible. Because, of course, there are other aids that are extra books, right? But these are some aids that may be found in the Bible. Like Bible facts, uh, Jewish cultural um, ways of doing things in biblical times. They might have a section in your Bible related to that. Um, book overview. So each book of the Bible sometimes, so say for Psalms, they might give you um, an explanation of the book of Psalms and it's a whole paragraph or a couple paragraphs. But sometimes they have it in the back of the book. In fact, my book has it in the back of the book, not, not on each chapter. But those are book overviews. If you kind of want to know historically, well, when was this written? Why was this written? They might give you some information related to that. You mentioned before charts, illustrations, and maps usually found in the back of the book, but they can be in the middle. They can be in different spots. Commentary, which of course is the author's opinion. So take that with a grain of salt. Concordance, Bible concordances. My, my, this Bible actually has a concordance in the back. And a concordance is if you're, you kind of remember a scripture, but you only know a part of it. So you think of the key word and you can look in the back. Like, like here, so maybe I was looking up about hell, and I'm looking for a particular scripture. In the back of here in my concordance, I can look at the word hell. It's usually in alphabetical order. And read through the little, it gives you a portion of the scripture, different scriptures related to that. And then you can find, possibly find the scripture you're looking for. Now, the one in the physical Bible is not as good as 
those extra concordances. So the Strong's Concordance is a really good concordance, but it's related to the King James Version. And so if you're trying to find a scripture from the King James Version, it has every Ver, every word in that concordance that, and you can find it in, in that concordance so if this concordance doesn't work when I'm at home I'll pull out my bigger book but you can again you can go online and look it up that's another good good way to study going online dictionary this Bible does have a dictionary in the back and it gives um, explanations of things um, like what is a Herodian or different types of things in the back of your book. So it can be helpful when you're studying and you're like, well, what is that kind of mean? You can look in your dictionary to find out what it actually means. And using a regular dictionary is helpful too. And then sometimes if you're, you're like, oh, I, I, I want to study something, but I don't know what to study. So there might be a list of suggested topics in the back of your Bible. And it, it'll give you scripture references too. So sometimes that can be helpful for you to begin your study. Next slide. This is uh, how to use your Bible. Keep clicking again. So it's cover to cover. And then click again. And then one more time. So this is how to get more familiar with your Bible. So we've kind of covered... The big, this last section I just did is more if you're kind of looking for a Bible, you want to buy a Bible, those are some things to consider when you're looking, when you're physically looking or you're going online and looking. Look for those the different types of things we mentioned that are important to you, that's helpful to you. And the only reason to do all of that is so that you will actually study. You will actually open it and read it. So that's that would be helpful for for each of us, if that's something that you want to do. So that's why we're kind of doing this study today, to kind of give you an idea on what's available in my Bible. How do I actually start studying? So some people never really sat down and studied. They're, they've been so busy, but maybe life has kind of calmed down a little bit. You, you can actually begin. And what things, what tools do I have to actually do it? Because sometimes you can't afford to have a bunch of other things. Everything might be in that one Bible that you already have, and you don't need to go out and purchase anything. It might already be available to you. Next slide. So in your Bible, I don't know if you've ever noticed, there's little little subletters, or they're upscripted, the little A or a 1. There's meanings for that that has a purpose for each of us. There's standard layouts, as we talked about before, and capitalization, punctuation, footnotes. That helps you when you're actually reading the Bible. So remember, this presentation doesn't cover everything. That's why, so when you're chiming in and it says, oh, yeah, that's true, you know, there's a lot of other avenues. And I'm kind of giving you some big clues to help you when you're actually studying scripture. Next slide. Now, in your Bible, <clears throat> in the front area, there's usually these white pages, or even in the back, there's white pages. So what I've done, I don't know if you can see it very well, but I've written on this front cover some of my favorite verses. I've also written um, the churches that I've attended and when I started attending. So I came to Wellspring on 19 June 2016 in my Bible. Because if you ask me, I'm not going to remember. I'll just open my Bible and show, you know, look for the date. Um, also, I've written three, four things. I dedicated my life to Jesus Christ and received him as my Lord and Savior on August 18, 1974 at age 15. So if you're good at math, you can figure out how old I am. <laughs> I was baptized in water on August 11th, 1975. I was 16 years old. I received a baptism in the Holy Spirit on March 27, 1976 at age 17. And then my favorite um, scripture verse is Philippians 1, 
verse 21, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So that's a, like a suggestion, you know, if you want to remember those important dates in your life, it's good to write it in your Bible. What I've used the back white pages for is to write down when I've read through the Bible. Now, I've not been consistent in writing them down, I've noticed here, but that's a kind of a good place to compile, you know, that you finished it. Just a little tick mark so you remember what years you've done it to encourage you to continue it every year. Next page. So in the in Bibles, there's a presentation page, and that's what they look like. This Bible is presented to, and um, it allows you to put your the, your you're the owner of the Bible, so it's a good thing to write that there. And the two line, sometimes well, the two line is your name, and then if you bought it for yourself, because it's it, there's a buy on here. Pre, this Bible was presented by. Well, if nobody presented but you bought it yourself, that means that God helped you buy it because, of course, your finances help you buy Bibles. So you can put a name of God that you, you like or a name of the Holy Spirit, like the helper, the Holy Spirit. He's my helper. Help me buy this Bible. Whatever significant um, name of God that will help you, I would write it in there. And then the date that you bought it. So... I've written here July 28, 1979. This is how old this Bible that I bought long, many years ago. Next page. Family pages. Now, in the Bible, there are different family. There's, there may be a section after that presentation page, or it could be in the middle of the Bible. Most of those big Bibles that you may have on your coffee table have a section for the deaths in your family, the marriages, um, your husband's family tree, your wife's family tree, your, who are your children, who's their, your grandchildren, or who's their children, or church records. So this is a good source for when people are doing genealogy. It's a good way to make sure that your family knows information about your family. So it can be located in your Bible, and you can write it in there. I know, I think I have one in mine here, but of course I don't have any children, so. Oh, under deaths, I put my name and I put to die is gain. I put my favorite scripture because I didn't have any other things to fill in there. So, you know, you can do anything in your in your Bible. And it's usually are the heavier white paper that's in the front or back or even in the middle section of your Bible. Next page is usually the title page, and it tells you what version of the Bible it is. It does it have Old and New Testament? Are there red letters? Or is it self-pronouncing? That's kind of what it's up there. You may not be able to see it very clearly. Next page. Normally, there's a table of contents, and even the table of contents can vary. Um, it'll have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus in order. It'll have the books in order. And it tells you what page it is. In my Bible, it also tells me how many chapters are in each of the books of the Bible. So there's 50. In the book of Genesis, there are 50 chapters, total of 50 chapters. It'll tell you when it, where it's, what page number it starts on. There are some contents that are in alphabetical order. For those who don't know that, Leviticus is in the Old Testament. You can look alphabetically and find it and find the page number and go and then you'll realize, oh, that's closer to the front of the book, so that's the Old Testament. So there's different types of table of contents and whatever is helpful for you, that's what you should look for. Next page. So in the table of contents, there's also paragraphing or chapter numbers. So just to let you know, there are 929 chapters in the Old Testament. And it was translated from Hebrew and Aramaic. Now the New Testament, there are actually 200... Let me just 
260 chapters. So as we learned at the picnic, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And the New Testament contains the red letters. It's not in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. That might seem like a simple thing, but not everybody understands that, that the red letters are the words spoken by Jesus while he was on earth, and they're usually found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But you can also find it in Acts or and Revelation even, and First Corinthians. This is my body, right? That one. So there are little ones here and there. But it's important if you want to know that, okay, when, when is Jesus speaking? Next page. The parts of the Bible. Oh, we're not going to get to the parts of the Bible because we reached 1030. So anybody have any questions? Any comments? Or? I know it's real, I mean, it's simple things. We all kind of know them, but we don't really know that we know them. And it's like, wow, I actually know a lot about the Bible, which I didn't know I knew. So it's been kind of interesting doing this study. So I'm trying to write a book. That's kind of my purpose. So I've been doing this. So I appreciate your attention and thank you. And let's pray. Thank you, God, for today. We thank you for all that we've learned and all that we're going to keep on learning and just help us each one to dive more into your word and to use these little tools and things that you've provided for us that we can actually read your word and put it in our hearts. I thank you for today. Just continue your blessing upon us as we continue to worship you in all the other ways that we're serving you today. In your name I pray. Amen.